So good morning, everyone. Today's presentation is on mental health awareness by Susa Saglora. So she's a licensed clinical psychiatrist in assistant professor of psychiatry in clinical psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medicine and an assistant attending psychiatrist at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She has a faculty practice at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medicine Center where she provides various clinical services. Additionally, she provides treatment to young adult graduates and medical students through Weill Cornell Medicine Graduate Center Mental Health Program. The presentation will be about suicide prevention, mental health, and resilience. So whenever you're ready. Hey, thank you so much, Jesse. I'm glad to be here today to present on improving your mental wellness. So let's just have a quick overview of the presentation. So we're gonna talk about what exactly is mental wellness and how we can boost our mental wellness. And we're gonna talk about a lot about resilience today because that is part of how we can boost our mental wellness. And then we're gonna talk about different skills, the power of your thoughts, a model for reframing thoughts, positive self-talk, and a lot about building relationships we're gonna do a mindfulness practice today. I'm gonna to talk a lot about mindfulness and then we'll save some time at the end yeah, to have a Q&A. Yeah. So first off, what is mental wellness? So mental wellness is a dynamic, renewable and positive resource. It's an active process that requires initiative and conscious action. And mental wellness is an internal experience that encompasses multiple dimensions. So mental wellness has been associated with the concept of psychological well-being. Now, psychological well-being includes self-acceptance, personal growth, purpose, autonomy, environmental mastery, and positive relationships. So mental wellness has been described as a state of being. And it's really a balance point between your personal resources and life's challenges. And increasing our level of mental wellness can actually help us protect against developing mental illness. So that's why it's so important and we're talking about it today. So we want to keep in mind that mental wellness is not a static state of being. So it moves around depending on what's happening in your life externally and internally. So mental wellness is a lifelong process. It's a proactive strategy. So these are strategies to strengthen our mental, emotional, social, and psychological resources. So on one level, mental wellness is really about prevention. It's also about coping with life's, life's traumas and adversity and being resilient when facing these challenges. And then on another level, mental wellness moves us into a deeper, a richer, more meaningful human experience, which is often described as flourishing. So how can we boost our mental wellness? So there's a lot of ways we can boost our mental wellness. And one of the key ways is by building our resilience. So what exactly is resilience? So resilience is the process and outcome of successfully adapting to life's challenges and setbacks. And then primarily through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to external and internal demands. So we have external demands, the world, relationships, work, what have you. And then we also have internal demands, which we're gonna talk about. So psychologists define resilience as a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, and significant stress, such as family, relationship stressors, serious health problems, and workplace and financial stressors that we all experience at one time or another. So as much as resilience involves the ability to bounce back from difficult experiences, it can also involve profound personal growth. And this profound personal growth actually increases our resilience. So we'll talk more about that. So it's important to note that resilience can change over time. Resilience is not a trait that you either have or you don't have. It's a skill that can be learned. 
And we're gonna talk about the skills today and actually practice some. So we can develop resiliency by intentionally changing our thoughts and behaviors. And over time through neuroplasticity, our physical brain can change to reinforce the skill of resilience. So we're really what we're doing is we're practicing these skills and by practicing these skills can actually change our brain, which helps us be fortify ourselves against life's challenges and helps us fortify ourselves um, from you know preventing or exacerbating our mental health. So resilience has been explained like a constant equation. We can ask which side of the um, equation weighs more, right? So stressors can be, so if we have stressors on this side and then we have resilience on this side, sometimes our stressors can become so intense that it overwhelms our resilience and we lose our resilience. The thing is, that's why we want to do these practices so that we can build up that resilience so that the stressors don't overwhelm our resilience. So I've heard people say, I've never been resilient. I wasn't resilient as a kid. I don't come from a resilient family. But the truth is studies have shown that people who weren't resilient when they were children or teenagers have been able to develop resilience so that they're able to come overcome adversity in life. So we're gonna talk about what resilience is and what it is not, because there's actually a lot of myth on resilience. So resilience is developed over time. It's something that you can cultivate through these strategies and practices that I've mentioned. Attitudes and skills can be learned and practiced and it's a universal human ability to thrive and setbacks. So resilience is not something that you're born with. It's not something you can buy, and it's not immunity or absence of pain, loss, or negative emotions, and that's important. Sometimes we think if we have enough resilience, we're not gonna experience the pain that happens in life. The emotional pain is what I'm talking about. But that's just part of being human. What the resilience does is it helps you be able to deal with the emotional pain when it comes in difficult situations. And resilience is not a quick fix or a life hack, and it's not unique to any specific group. So talking about building resilience. So we have areas where we can develop capacity for resilience. So first we wanna think about autonomy. So it's been shown that resilient individuals have a greater sense of what's called an internal locus of control. And what's key there is they believe that they, and not themselves, and them, they believe that they are the reason for their circumstances, for their achievements. They don't believe that something external to them created their circumstances or their achievements. So they have a feeling of autonomy on life, that they can make things happen, that they can make things better. Also psychological flexibility. So psychological flexibility is really not being stuck in your ways, right? Being, we wanna be aware of rigid thinking. So in a sense, flexible, um, being psychologically flexible is the ability to change your mind. And then social competence. So the ability to increase positive connections, and we're gonna talk a lot about positive connections, and then a positive mental attitude. And then there's a number of factors that contribute to how well people adapt to life's adversities. So the first I wanna talk about is the availability and quality of social resources. So the key in that sentence is quality. We want to emphasize the word quality. So people might have a lot of social connections, but if these connections are stressful or fraught with negativity, it can actually decrease our, real, our resilience and chip away at our mental wellness. And then specific coping strategies. So psychological research has demonstrated that these resources and skills are associated with greater resilience and be, can be cultivated through practice. Practice is the key word. It's like when you're trying to learn anything new, you've got to practice it to become really good at it. So these skills, which at the end of when we finish, we're going to work on one of the key skills for resilience. Um, and then this 
last one is really key. The ways in which individuals perceive and engage with themselves, others, and the world. So there's a resilience researcher, Dr. George Bonanno, and he said one of the central elements of resilience is your perception. He says, do you conceptualize an event as defeating and catastrophic or as an opportunity to learn and grow? And he's coined a term, potentially traumatic event, which he argues is more accurate. And it's really a very straightforward theory. Every frightening event has the potential to be traumatic or not to the person experiencing it. And let's say you do perceive the event as traumatic. There's something called post-traumatic growth. And that's when a person learns and grows from the experience, which actually increases their resilience. So as events happen that are difficult, if you can grow and learn from them, you're actually increasing, you're building that resilience muscle. And I wanted to share this, this quote. This is from a book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Um, you may know it. And he was a prisoner in the Nazi concentration camps during World War II. And one of his great learnings from that horrific experience was everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of his human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of the circumstances, to choose one's way. So he's really talking about our choice of how to perceive life events. And sometimes it feels like we don't have a choice. But in reality, we actually always have a choice because it's within us. That's something that we can control is our perception of life events. So let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of what is called a stress resist resilient person. So research has shown the kinds of emotional and behavioral characteristics that tend to describe this stress resilient person. Not a surprise, optimism is at the top of the list. So are you a half glass full type of person, right? Having that optimistic outlook. Again, the strong, positive social support system. Importantly, we haven't talked about it, but the ability to find purpose and meaning in your life. And then also a grounding in faith or spirituality can increase our resilience. So today we're gonna to look at five areas where we can build resilience. Building relationships, self-care, cultivating healthy thoughts, finding purpose and meaning, and being able to accept change. So we're gonna talk a lot about change because that's one constant we have, as we all know in life, is change. But first I wanna talk about building relationships. So we want to prioritize healthy relationships. We want to cultivate connections with empathetic and understanding people. We want to focus on finding trustworthy, compassionate individuals who validate our feelings. And that supports our resilience, building resilience. So, but there's something important to note here is we want to be able to check our own selves. Are we empathetic and understanding to others? Do we validate others? Are we trustworthy? We really want to look at what we bring to relationships because it's unrealistic to kind of expect all those things from someone else when we can't give those things or we don't give those things. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, like what we bring to relationships and what we bring to ourselves. We also want to cultivate healthy relationships with others in part because it reminds us that we're not alone in the midst of life's difficulties. So that's something that really chips away at our resilience when we feel alone and we feel isolated. So that's why we want to be able to reach out for help and accept the help when it's there. So that can be difficult though because sometimes it's hard to ask for help for a lot of different reasons. A person might believe, have a belief like, if I ask for help, I look like I'm weak, or I'm a failure, or 
You could be afraid that if you reach out for help, the help won't be there. So that's something to think about. Are you able to reach out for help to people that you care about and they care about you? And then joining groups. That's a really wonderful way to build relationships. So civic groups, faith-based communities, local organizations, all of that can provide the social support that we need to build our resilience to help our mental wellness. And then the next relationship we're gonna talk about, um, which is really the most important and most enduring relationship we'll ever have is the relationship we have with ourselves. So what is the relationship with ourselves? That can sound a little odd. Um, the relationship with ourselves is really our relationship with our self-talk. So how we talk to ourselves. So the thoughts that we think about ourselves. So we could look at it like our relationship with our thoughts about ourselves. So you can ask yourself, are my thoughts about myself compassionate? Am I understanding towards myself? Or do I have a harsh inner critic? You can see like the harsh inner critic is like that voice that's always going. So all of us have like thoughts, we can call it the voice in the head that are telling us things, telling us things about ourselves, about other people. We really want to focus on what are these thoughts about ourselves because the thoughts about ourselves are the relationship with ourselves and it actually sets the tone for our other relationships, how we talk to ourselves. So that, the relationship with yourself really cannot be understated. And that's gonna take us into really the power of our thoughts. And our thoughts really, in very many ways, can create a good portion of our reality because we live with ourselves, it's 24 seven. So you can almost think of the thoughts of like, if you really start to look at your thoughts, observe them, and notice the content of the thoughts. Is, are, is the content positive? Is it caring? Is it compassionate? Or is it kind of negative? Is it punitive? Is it critical? So I think this quote sums it up nicely. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character watch your character, it becomes your destiny. So we want to cultivate healthy thoughts, thoughts that will help us build resilience. And really the reality of how you think can play, like I said, a significant role in how you feel and how resilient you are when you're faced with life's obstacles. So to cultivate healthy thoughts. So people often ask me, well, how do, you, how do I cultivate? Thoughts. First, we want to become aware of our thoughts. We want to become the watcher of our thoughts. And there's something called metacognition. Metacognition is where you're thinking about your thinking. So oftentimes we don't even notice our thoughts. We're really on automatic pilot. The thoughts come and we just react, right? And so the thoughts come, we react. As opposed to noticing our thoughts and being able to kind of pause and ask ourselves, is this thought helpful to help me build resilience? Or is it not gonna help me build resilience? Um, and so really, what, we're, what I'm starting to talk about, we do in a therapy called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, CBT. And we're gonna talk a little bit about CBT. Um, so CBT has something called thinking errors. And it's really like what CBT would say is a rational thinking. So do you have a tendency to catastrophize difficulties? So meaning if something happens, do you start to think worst case scenario is going to happen? Or do you think, oh, maybe this can work out. Maybe I can do X, Y, Z. So where does your mind go when something difficult happens? And then there's another thinking, um, error called fortune telling. And this is something that a lot of people do. Um, it's where you think about future situations and you think you know what's gonna happen and it's gonna be bad. And you play the scenario over in your mind over and over again. And they call it fortune telling really because none of us knows what the future is. But our minds will tell us we do. 
But that, though, that actually breaks down our resilience and our mental wellness when we're thinking about future situations and how they're going to go very poorly. And then rumination. So rumination is where you think about a thought over and over again. And it's really with rumination, we're talking about more negative thoughts. And these are the kind of thoughts that will keep us up at night. And then worries. So usually with rumination, we're thinking about things we're worried about. Like thoughts like if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. And you worry and you think about all these scenarios that could happen. The thing is, is the worry doesn't actually change any outcomes. Now, sometimes we think like we have to worry. And what I like to say is worry is thinking that pretends to be necessary. We think somehow by worrying, we are affecting the outcome. We're actually, we're not changing the outcome, but we are changing ourselves internally. We're making ourselves more stressed, which leads to mood symptoms, anxiety, and also can give us physical symptoms too, right? With higher blood pressure. So we're really affecting our physical and our mental health with worrying. And then the last thinking error I'm going to mention is called mind reading. And it's where we think we know what another person is thinking. And I don't know if anybody experiences this mind reading. I think most people do a little mind reading where they think, oh, this person thinks this about me, or I know what that person's thinking. And I laugh a little just because if we really could mind read, we'd be in a very different situation. We'd probably be invited to Good Morning America or something, but we can't mind read. But in our minds, we think that we know what others are thinking. So, and a lot of times we think people are thinking maybe negative things about us and that's the other person's not even really thinking about us. So the point is that that can also chip away at our resilience. Um, if we're thinking, we know what other people are thinking and that they're not thinking, you know, nice things about us. So we want to try to adopt a more balanced and realistic thinking pattern. So, for example, if you're overwhelmed by a challenge and things don't go the way you wanted, you want to remind yourself that what happened in that instance isn't an indicator of how the future will go. And you want to remind yourself you're not helpless. And you may not be able to change a highly stressful event. There's some events we can't change, but we can change how we interpret or respond to it. And this is the one of the things we work on in cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's really what Viktor Frankl was talking about is our perception of events. So the good news is there is a model for reframing thoughts. I'll go back to CBT. That's very much what we do in CBT is reframe thoughts or also called cognitive um, reformation. So we want to think about how we can reframe thoughts. So Dr. Bonanno, who I mentioned before, who's this resilience researcher, said we can make ourselves more or less vulnerable to how we think about things. And so interestingly, there's a neuroscientist at Columbia, Kevin Oxner, who has shown that teaching people to reframe events in positive ways when their initial response is negative or in a less emotional way when their initial response is emotionally hot changes their experience of the event. So this is really important research because this research is actually, he's looking at MRI studies. He's looking at people's brains and how people's brains change when they look at a, at a stimuli, an event that is a originally seen as negative to them and then they reframe it as positive. It actually makes changes in our brain, which changes how we feel. And that's more of that building resilience that we've been talking about. So the first thing we've got to observe the thoughts, then challenge the thoughts. So the challenge is I'm going to reframe this thought and then changing the thought. That is the model. I think it went the wrong way. So we want to talk a little bit about positive self-talk. So there's a lot of research about self-talk. 
about negative self-talk and positive self-talk. A lot of research overall. So there's some research that's come out of UCLA about thoughts. And what they found is 77% of our thoughts are negative and repetitive. And 23 are positive and new thoughts. So this is like obviously a generalization. Some people probably have 23% negative and 77 percent positive the point is you want to think about like what's your ratio of positive to negative thoughts because that does affect your mood that affects everything right so we want to think about positive self-talk that's that strengthens our resilience so here's some thoughts this is hard but i can get through it i've overcome difficulties in the past i can find a way through this too I will feel great about myself once this is over. What kill you? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. This is a learning process. And then we have resilience weakening self-talk. And we can look at that as negative self-talk. So for example, why did I put myself through this? What's the point anyway? If I can't do things perfectly, I might as well give up. That's that perfectionism voice. Maybe I don't belong here. I'm not good enough. No one understands what I'm going through. And these resilience weakening thoughts are all actually really emotionally painful thoughts. So they have consequences. And that's where we can see like the mood symptoms, depressive symptoms coming. It's hard to feel good. It's hard to feel positive when you have thoughts like that. And then we want to increase our self-care. So self-care, we hear a lot about that. It's actually a very legitimate practice and we want to think about how we can increase our self-care because that strengthens, strengthens our body and our mind and it helps us adapt to stress and reduce emotions like anxiety and depression. So you want to be able to take care of your body. Um, so it's all the things we know and a lot of the things that all of us sometimes neglect doing, we want to get you know, proper nutrition, enough sleep, hydration, we want to exercise, and then also building a mindfulness practice. Um, so there's a, a lot, a lot of science on mindfulness, and you may already have a mindfulness practice. You may have heard about it. You may have practiced mindfulness, but we're going to talk a little bit about it now. So the definition of mindfulness is the awareness Mindfulness is the awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And that's by John Kabat-Zinn, who brought mindfulness to the U.S. Um, in the late 70s. And since then, there's been a lot of research on mindfulness, and they use mindfulness in hospitals, in outpatient settings. It's, it's something that can be very helpful. Um, and so I often explain mindfulness like this. So we know that going to the gym for exercise is healthy for our bodies because it keeps us fit. So mindfulness training is just like taking your, your brain to the gym for a workout. When we practice mindfulness, we are training our attention to stay in the present moment instead of wandering off into thoughts of the past or thoughts of the future. Because what does it mean to be in the present moment? Well, we're so often thinking, 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 like right now, you know, your mind might be thinking about like, oh, it's almost lunch time. What am I going to have for lunch time? And what am I going to do? And so you really can miss what's happening in the present moment. So mindfulness helps us train our minds to be in the present moment so that we can decide what we want to focus on. So that when our mind wanders to the future and is worried, and that worry isn't helping us, it's actually hurting us. We can bring our mind back to the present and stop that worrying. So I'm gonna tell you about some of the benefits from the research because it's pretty amazing. So the research is showing that practicing mindfulness, and this is having a regular daily practice of mindfulness leads to improvements in both physical and psychological symptoms as well as positive changes in health and your attitude and behaviors. So mindfulness is an important element in the treatment of a number of mental health problems, including depression, 
substance use, eating disorders, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And the recent research provides strong evidence that practicing mindfulness changes our brain. So it's that neuroplasticity that I mentioned earlier. The mindfulness can help change our brain. Um, and some experts actually believe that mindfulness works in part by helping people accept their experiences, including painful emotions, rather than reacting to them or avoiding them. So a lot of times when we have painful emotions, we want to avoid, and there's a lot of different ways we can avoid, you know, eating substances, binge watching, shopping. I mean, there's so many different ways we can distract ourselves, but that actually can cause problems for us. So the idea of being able to accept whatever happens in the present moment, accept how you're feeling in the present moment. So it also helps us kind of gain perspective on life. And that's where we bring in that psychological flexibility. And we're able to deal with those thinking errors, those kind of irrational um, self-defeating thoughts. And mindfulness can also decrease burnout. And like I said, it strengthens our attention and our focus. It gives us more choice in life. It also improves our physical health. So scientists have discovered that mindfulness techniques help improve physical health in a number of ways. Mindfulness can relieve stress. It can treat heart disease, lower blood pressure, reduce chronic pain. It can improve our sleep. It can alleviate gastrointestinal difficulties and it can Im improve our immune functioning. So that's a lot of benefits to mindfulness. And mindfulness is something that you can do and actually doesn't really cost much. Um, so let's just talk about a couple of the ways that you can practice mindfulness. So you can practice mindfulness through mindfulness meditation. You can do what's called mindful journaling, where when you journal, you're very present. You're kind of noticing each well, I'm imagining you're writing in the journal. Each stroke of the pen, you're very present with what you're writing. You can do yoga. There's other spiritual or contemplative practices like prayer or meditation. And really, when you're engaging in these practices, it helps you focus on positive aspects of your life. So you're cultivating positive aspects of your life. Mindful walking, that's something you can do anywhere. So I always think about like if you have like a commute where you go to work or you go somewhere, you get off the train or you're driving and you get to your destination and you didn't notice anything about your drive or your walk. And, you know, sometimes you're thankful you just got there um, and that you're safe because your mind is on this autopilot and you're thinking, thinking about thoughts. So the idea of mindful walking is that you're really in the present moment, focusing and noticing what's around you. So noticing the weather, noticing the people passing by, noticing the scents, the sights. Um, so that's mindful walking. So that's something to explore and it's something that you can do. You can do that anywhere you are, mindful walking. And then mindful eating. And that's this is something they will teach in workshops. It's really how you can savor your food and not eat quickly. Like sometimes like we'll be reading while we're eating or watching TV. It's really being present with your food and taking the food in, really tasting it and enjoying it. And that's another very pleasurable experience that can increase our resilience. So we are going to talk about a little bit more about acceptance, the practice of acceptance. So mindfulness practice involves accepting whatever arises in each moment. So accepting the emotions that arise, and it involves being kind and forgiving towards yourself. So we want to be able to accept change and practice psychological flexibility. So, change, so we know that change is part of life. Life is always changing. We're always changing. So sometimes certain goals are no longer attainable. So we might have a goal that is no longer attainable. So 
being able to accept that something is we can't change actually helps us focus on circumstances that we can alter. Because when we focus on things that we can't change, we're actually in resistance to what is the reality, to the present moment. And that resistance to what is causes stress and causes a lot of our mood symptoms and distress. So we wanna think about how can we accept things that we can't change. We're not talking about accepting things we can't, that we can't, that we can change. If we can change something, we're gonna talk about skills to do that. But if we can't change it and we're just resisting the idea of it, that's not helping us. So psychologists have found that the thought of change in ending, like in the ending of one thing and the beginning of another underlies a great deal of anxiety. And probably we all know this, the idea of change can produce anxiety. And so they have this term intolerance of uncertainty. And I really, I love that term because there's so much uncertainty in life and all of us to some degree have an intolerance for it. It's just where you fall on that spectrum. And if there's too much intolerance, that's where we're gonna see our mental wellness start to degrade because the stress will become so great. Um, I love this um, quote by, um, his name is Dr. Kelly Wilson. He's a professor at the University of Mississippi and he's one of the co-developers of a therapy called Acceptance Commitment Therapy Act. And he says, the avoidance of suffering produces more suffering. And really, because when we're resisting what is true in the moment, it creates more suffering. So I love this, suffering is an argument with reality. You might have heard that before. Suffering is an argument with reality. We don't like the reality, so we resist it. But the resisting isn't helping us, it's actually hurting us. So more skills that we can build, so say, for things that we can change, we can problem solve. So we can work on problem solving. And then also seeking internal validation from yourself. So this goes back to your relationship with yourself that we were talking about. So a lot of times we seek external validation and we want that validation from other people. And that's fine. It's good to get, get external validation. The thing is we can't count on that. So in a sense, we've got to build that muscle inside ourselves to validate ourselves. We also want to learn how to say no. We want to learn when and how to say no. So a lot of people, they have no problem saying no. And they like saying no. It's not an issue. Other people, it's very hard to say no. And that gets into when there's people pleasing behaviors, like you're afraid to say no because you're afraid you're gonna make someone mad, something, you're gonna lose a relationship. The thing is, if you keep saying yes to enough things, what happens is it starts to lower that resilience because it's impinging on your time. You also can start getting angry and resentful at the people you're saying yes to because you really want to say no. So that's a big one, is thinking about how you react when someone asks you to do something. Do you automatically say yes and then later regret it? So you might wanna think about how you can start to say no to people gracefully without losing relationships. And maybe sometimes you do lose relationships, but in a sense, it's like you wanna be able to prioritize your own mental wellness um, and like we mentioned, we want to know when to ask for help. And then importantly, we want to celebrate our accomplishments, big and small. A lot of times we don't celebrate our accomplishments. And sometimes we say, oh, that wasn't a big deal. <laughs> but the thing is, when we accomplish something, we want to be our own cheerleaders and we want to celebrate. Um, we want to accept compliments and credit for our work. Um, we want to believe in ourselves and our abilities. And a practice that's really nice is a gratitude practice. So by ending the day by reflecting and writing down like three things that you're grateful for. It's actually a wonderful practice to help um, elicit those positive emotions. 
So now we are going to do a mindfulness practice. So I'm going to invite you to do this mindfulness meditation along with me. And with this meditation, it's called the five senses meditation. We move our attention and our awareness to each of our five senses one at a time. And while you're doing this practice, um, you might notice thoughts coming to your head. You, I'm sure you will. It's completely normal. That's what our minds do. Our minds are designed to think. The whole idea of mindfulness is, is that if you can catch when you go into a thought, you want to bring yourself back to your breath. You notice a thought, come back to your breath. And I want you to take this as an opportunity to be kind to yourself. Try not to judge yourself. Just notice if you're having any thoughts, like I said, and you can gently redirect your attention back to your breath. Your breath is your, really your anchor to the present moment. So what I'm going to do is I am going to ring my bell. And that is going to begin the practice. And then I will ring the bell at the end of the practice. So after I ring the bell, I'm going to give you the instructions to start the practice. So first, make sure you're sitting in a comfortable position. And plant your feet so they're flat on the floor. If you're sitting on the ground, just notice the weight of your body on the floor. You can take your hands and rest them in your lap with your palms up. And you can gently close your eyes or you can turn your gaze down toward the floor, whatever is most comfortable for you. And just notice your breath. There's no need to change your breath. Just bring attention to each part of your breath. With the inhale, your exhale, and the space in between. And now we're going to bring awareness to each of your five senses, one at a time, for a couple minutes each. And the point here is to focus on the present moment and how each of your sen senses is activated. So I want you to take three deep cleansing breaths. And as you take these breaths, just relax. And now I want you to bring your attention to notice the smells in your environment. You may smell food. You might smell paper or books. See if you can notice the smells without judging them as good or bad. And just take a notice to notice these scents. And now take another deep breath and shift your attention to your sense of taste. You may notice an aftertaste of a previous meal or drink. We have tastes in our mouths all the time that go unnoticed. You can just notice your tongue in your mouth, your saliva, your breath as you exhale. And you can run your tongue over your teeth and cheeks to help you become more aware. And try to observe any taste without judgment like or dislike. And if you notice your mind has wandered, bring your attention back to your breath. Bring your attention back to your inhale and exhale. And now take another deep breath and shift your attention to your sense of touch. Bring your attention to the sensations of your skin in contact with the chair or your clothing. Notice the pressure of your feet on the floor. Notice the pressure of your body sitting on the chair. 
Observe any temperatures like warmth or coolness on your hands or face. And just notice the sensation of touch. And now you can take another deep breath. And I want you to shift your attention to your hearing, noticing the sounds around you. See if you can stretch your hearing out to the furthest part of the room you're in even outside the room to hear the faintest of sounds. And now take another deep breath and we're going to shift your attention to your sense of sight. You can keep your eyes closed if you like and just notice the tones on the back of your eyelids or you can open your eyes to observe your surroundings and notice the color and shapes and textures. You may notice more things now than you did before. And if your eyes are open, just gently close them. If you notice thoughts have come into your mind, you can ju just gently redirect your attention to your breath. And just take a moment to notice how you feel in this moment, how your body feels. And now I want you to take three deep, relaxing breaths. And you can gently move your fingers and toes and start to move around. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back to the room. Okay. So we can take some questions now. If anybody wants to share about their experience doing the mindfulness, it might have been the first time you did the mindfulness. It was definitely my first time doing mindfulness. And I got an email and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> gotta go back. Uh oh, <laughs> here, I lost my screen sharing. So I'm gonna try and get back. Can you see my slideshow right now? No, I cannot. Okay. All right. Well, I can take questions without it up there. I, I Somehow it just disappeared. So there wasn't really much left. So, uh, Do we have so but Jesse, you just brought up like an interesting point of how life can distract us and life is very distracting. And, you know, with, with our little uh, devices here we all have, mm -hmm. it can be a challenge nice. to stay present, right? Because even when we're meditating, if we haven't turned off our phone, we hear the ping, we're like, oh, who texted me? <laughs> I need to look at it. Uh, let's see, I'm looking to see if there's a, looks like there might be a question in the chat. Jesse, are you reading the questions or should I go into the chat? Well, we just have a question. Can we get this recording or slideshow? So slideshows, can we get them or? Oh, I can send the slides. Should I, do you want me to send the presentation to you? Yeah, sure. You can send it to me and I'll send it to whoever asked. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me see. Oh, you're welcome. 
Yes, thank you for this amazing break in our day. Well, thank you for coming. I'm very passionate about this. I think it's so important. And if there's, I don't know if what anybody took away from this presentation, which I would love to hear. Um, I mean, you could throw it into the chat. Um, I think one of the most important things is really your relationship with yourself. Um, a lot of times we don't conceptualize our thoughts as a relationship with ourselves and improving our relationship with ourselves really can increase our resilience and mental wellness to such a high degree. So it's just so important for our mental health, how we feel about ourselves and also how we feel about others. He says, this was great. Thank you. I'm trying to meditate regularly like this five cents practice. And Julie. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, the mindfulness really is a practice and that's how we start to notice changes. So in the beginning, it can be really challenging. And I've taught meditation to a lot of people and I often hear people say, I'm really bad at meditating. And first of all, I say, well, that's a judgment. So we want to try to be non-judgmental. And you're not bad at meditating. Your mind is just always thinking and that's what minds do. So we're not really taught how to take a pause and bring our attention back to the present moment. That's not something, maybe they're starting to teach it in schools in some places, but most of us haven't learned that. So it takes time. It's really like learning a new skill. So I always say, if you can take, pick a time during the day that you can pencil it into your schedule so that it's something that is important to you and that you will do. And you can start with like five minutes. And there's a lot of really wonderful mindfulness apps out there. I think on my presentation that disappeared, I had a couple um, suggestions for apps, which you might know, but Headspace, Calm, 10% Happier is really nice and can be really helpful. Well, Larry has his hand up. Larry, you want to comment? Larry, you're on a mute. Sorry, thank you. Couldn't see the screen. Um, many of the civic lectures are imparting information. This one has information, lots of it, and it's a really great presentation. But I suspect part of your goal is to affect change. And yeah. the question would be, mm -hmm. what can we do to exploit the power of a group, we've got 35 at the moment, to do it again, to set up a series of these. Just videotapes, it's not that you need to be here every day and babysit it, but what else could you do or could we as a group do to promote this? This is cool, this is nice. I put my notes on a shelf, big deal. But if this actually gets me to do it three times a week, very big deal. I think you're making a really excellent point. You're absolutely right. And the power of community and doing the mindfulness in community is really helpful. And that's something that I, I don't know, I don't know where you are right now. Um, but I think there's certainly a lot of community centers and places that you can do it. But I agree with you. It's to find a community where you can go do some meditation, some mindfulness. So you're really connecting with some of the um, capacities that we talked about today, where you're building community, you're with people, we know that increases your resilience, and then you're working on that mindfulness practice. So you're right, the information is good, but really it's the experience and the action. It is what changes people, absolutely. The point that I was trying to make, and yeah, this is a yes and, not a yeah but. There are a whole series of, 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 of lectures and seminars through Civic. The people who attend to them, usually usual suspects, I recognize a lot of faces. That is a community. The question is, what can we do within the Civic community? And this is true for the nutrition lectures to affect change in terms of how people eat. Or we had things on stress reduction and chair yoga and things like that to create that sense of community to affect change within the Civic community. That's the question I'm asking. Yes. Larry, that's a question you should be asking us. Okay. <laughs> so we could talk separately with that. Okay. All right. Also, uh, Dr. Fuller, are you willing to uh, share your contact information? Yes, yes. In fact, 
Jesse, do you think that you could share that? I had it on the screen. Now I can actually, I'll just tell you what it is because I- Maybe I could put it in the meeting chat, like a- I'll put it email. in the chat, that's okay. Yeah, you could type in your email. So it's in the chat. Do you see it, Larry? Got it. And thank you. Yeah, feel free to email me. It's a lovely talk. Thank you. But I think you're right. Absolutely. Practices, having practices in your community will be really helpful. So who exploits the power of social support? One of the Absolutely. points we're making. 100%. It's sort, of a, it's sort of a feedback loop. You use the social support to improve your ability to access social support. Yeah, absolutely. That's really part of what the presentation's about. Thank you. Let me see. And then we have some comments saying that there's great presentation. And then Vicki Jones said, made a comment, your passion and belief in these principles are evident. Sometimes we need to be reminded of these principles. Uh, thank you. It's true. I'm really encouraging like a practice for people to start because it is absolutely life-changing. I've seen it um, with people I work with personally, um, but like Larry said, it really is the practice. It takes it out of the intellectual into the practice and that's where we can start to really affect change for ourselves. So. Diane also made a comment. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. I feel so relaxed and stressed. Oh, good. And I was holding before the session was is gone now. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you, Diane. I love hearing that. Thank you. This is wonderful. All right. That's all the comments and questions that we have, right? Any last comment before we say thank you? <laughs> Well, I'll give the last comment. Thank you for inviting me. It was really great to be with everyone today. And I appreciate just the opportunity to share something, like I said, that I'm passionate about and that I think can be really helpful. So it was nice to see everyone and I wish everyone a wonderful day. Yes. Have a wonderful day. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Bye. Yeah.